Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs>
the Stan Lee little cameo thing, if you will. Well, the beautiful thing is, is that you enjoy working with your family too. <laughs> well said. <laughs> That's true. And, and you can undercut your children. Exactly. Yes, exactly. That's yeah. funny. Look, you want more time on the tablet? Here you go. You got to do this line for me. Do your homework. Come on. Here we go. Yeah. Since you're directing this and, you know, Yao is one of the writers, John Wilson, Dennis Edwards. How did the story come about? Was it something that you had envisioned and then you brought writers on along? Or was this presented to you by the studio? Because I know this is based on an Arcana property, correct? Yeah, so this started off with Jim and Brian uh, going to Sang Shundui in China. This is an official Chinese-Canadian uh, co-production. And Sang Shundui is a recently discovered uh, lost city, much like Machu Picchu or Chichen Itza. Uh, it's not recognized by UNESCO yet. I've been over 100 UNESCOs. I do think it will be uh, one day recognized there. And so the true story is it is based on the lost city that actually occurred. It is, they did find these masks from there. And then Brian and Jim asked the question, what if these masks had magical abilities? And from there, it was kind of backwards filling it. So Pan Oswald's character, Aesop, is actually from Atlantis. Um, and then uh, Zuma is from Machu Picchu. And so this entire mythos started kind of occurring and it was all about lost cities and, and the powers that came from them. So you just went full ancient aliens and then ran with it. That's well, I love it. That's actually, well, I'm not saying it's aliens, but it's aliens. And from there, Arcana was able to um, produce the entire thing. Uh, one of the most complex characters, my favorite was probably Zoo. Uh, he turns into all 12 characters, animals of the Zodiac. So that was actually 13 models we had to build just for him. The human plus the 12 animals. My God. And then you translate the, was this all stop motion? No, it wasn't all stop motion, but it was, uh, you had your actual models that you animated from, correct? Exactly. So this is, uh, we use a program called Maya. So the plugins we use from a geeky perspective, we use Maya, uh, Yeti, which is what creates all the, uh, hair and fur. Uh, and then we also use uh, Nuke. Uh, Arnold is our renderer. And uh, yeah, mostly out of the box stuff. Uh, Aaron built our pipeline. And, and uh, you know, it's good to have done this. The one thing I look back on, it was kind of challenging because a lot of this production was done during COVID where people are working from home. So that was probably the biggest obstacle we had doing this. Uh, it, but the beautiful thing about that is that you were able to work from home and work remotely, especially with the voice acting and the animation. It wasn't, you didn't need to be around a ton of people. Exactly. So we were able to do it. Pat and actually recorded his from his home. He has a um, sound recording booth in his home, I think from um, uh, the Goldbergs, I think, for that reason. Wow. And what I, what I love about your work is that you're able to go from live action adult films like Corrective Measures, which is one of Bruce Willis's uh, final films coming out or has been released, I'm sorry. And then when you make your animated features, they're very family friendly, but there's not a lot of hidden jokes for adults that'll go over the kids' heads or, you know, the uh, kids that are in the know will get the dirty jokes. I like that you keep them family friendly. Thank you. And I do that very intentionally. For me, it's been like, if I'm going to do one, I, I don't want to necessarily bleed over. Um, I do love like Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and stuff where it does have that. But like if I'm doing a traditional animated, I feel like I'm almost cheating uh, kind of doing one. It's why like when I do a corrective measure is like, I really throw around the F word pretty solidly. Uh, I, I want it to go a little bit violent because I'm doing so much animation. It's kind of fun to take the gloves off and, you know, do other things as well. Yeah. The thing with, with that, like you said, you're allowed to take the gloves off and you're like, hey, my youngest is, I don't know, let's say 11. Uh, junior's not watching this one. My oldest is 17. You know, they can have at it. That sort of thing. But with this one, you can actually watch it with your family, with Heroes of the Golden Mask, and all ages will enjoy it. It's not so kiddie that parents feel numb and go, oh my God, I can't handle this. And it's not over the kids' heads. It's just a really enjoyable film. Well, thank you. That was the intent. Like, I find sometimes if I'm watching, I mean, Pixar, I think, does an excellent job, obviously. But sometimes I'm watching animated movies, and it's just like, 
you know, they call it four quadrant uh, viewing or co-viewing where the parents aren't like bashing their head and like Barney, sorry, Barney. But uh, that was one thing we just, it was really hard to watch some of that stuff. And for us, it was, you know, I want something, it starts off action. So like as a director, I think I've changed a little bit in terms of like, I really want to start my movies super strong. I have an excellent opening, kind of like Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, just kind of get people, whoa, what's happening? Uh, for me, that's exciting. And I believe Masks does that quite well. Well, also with Masks, you do a cross-cultural storytelling because you said it was a partnership between North America and China, but you have a modern day major metropolitan Western city and what your main character ends up in ancient China uh, as part of the cross-culturalism. So it's timeline shifts, it's time travel, it's, you know, just this world of internationalism that blends in a cohesive storytelling because human nature hasn't changed in the last 10,000 years of recorded history. Yeah, well, thank you. And that was very uh, intentional on that one. I, uh, it was fun because, you know, like you said, we're dealing with a lot of different things, uh, even fun things. So like in our Lovecraft trilogy, there was a portal. I got to reuse the same portal we did kind of maybe tying the universes together. Uh, but yeah, I had time travel, different cities, different areas. Uh, there's that juxtaposition of a young kid from Chicago going in ancient China. Uh, so I had a lot of fun with that. You know, in, in doing that, because time travel is hard. I mean, obviously, everyone's most favorite time travel movie is Back to the Future. Is sure. There, is there ever a chance when you do something like this with time travel, you're like, oh, I don't want to reference, you know, the Michael J. Fox classic. Oh, that's too similar to uh, the time machine. Oh, that's too similar to this over here. And you know, how do you keep it fresh in doing that in the creative process? Yeah, one of the things I try doing, I don't mind doing an homage, but I try not to usually do like a joke. Like if you watch some of the old Shreks, uh, they had very uh, time sensitive jokes. So you watch it 20 years later and some of them you're kind of like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. Like whatever was happening that year, American Idol or, or whatever it was. Um, and they're very, they can tend to be dated. So I try and avoid those things. Now an homage is a little different. Um, we, I don't know if there's one I necessarily did in masks per se. Mm, I remember one of the Howard Lovecrafts, uh, we had all five of the kids jumping forward and it was the same as Avengers two, where they did that, you know, horizontal panel shot and they all kind of jump forward. So I love a good homage. But necessarily telling a joke with a punchline that might not be referenced 10 years later, those ones I do try and avoid. Yeah, that, that's the problem with certain films when they do something like that. Like Soul Plane was so timely with all its jokes. And then Uncle Drew was the same thing that you have to go back and remember. You're like with Uncle Drew, I'll throw them under the bus, not in, ten, you know, in a negative manner. But like they made a lemonade joke based on Beyonce's album because it had just come out. Right. Because that's too timely. How far back do I have to remember? Did I like that album? Was the album any good? Was this like her flop album? You know, you have to put it in that context after a while. It takes you out of the film. Totally, totally. That's exactly right. So I try those type of things, but a good homage is great. I love it. You know, with, with working with your family, because your son Kiefer is also in this one, uh, you know, what's it like pulling in your kids after the third or fourth movie, are they still excited about it? Or are they just like, oh, dad, do I got to do this again? Because, you know, some kids want to be a part of the family business. And then other kids are just like, eh, that's just dad shtick. And, you know, that's his thing. I want to go be an engineer in this regard. Yeah, for me, I loved working. So Kiefer was the voice of Howard Lovecraft in the Howard Lovecraft trilogy. Uh, he's been acting since the age of four. His IMDb is actually longer and, and more well-rounded than mine. Um, and so he then, after the Howard Lovecraft trilogy, uh, he was one of the Mighty Ducks of the new TV series. And so he actually signed an exclusive Disney contract. So I actually weirdly wasn't able to work with my son. Uh, so this was, uh, this was cool actually to, to do it again years later. I mean, he's only 15, he turned 16 this year, but, um, you know, I haven't worked with him in three or four years. And he loves acting. He loves directing now is his big one. He has his new short film that's just finishing up called Buddy Love. Uh, but it's fun doing those type of things. And 
you know, seeing your son in a different angle. And it's, you know, for me as a director, one a great piece of advice I was given years ago is you're a director. So make sure you direct and use your voice. Uh, don't parrot, don't say to the, you know, person, I want you to do it like this. These peanuts are making me thirsty. It's more like, I want you to kind of hit the word peanut. Can you really emphasize that word? And so it's, that's the directing. And it's really hard not to just go, look, I want it done this way. And it's even harder maybe with your, your son, because, you know, you start to work with it, but Kiefer's such a professional. And I think maybe we think the same. So he was able to get it right away. Very quick work with him. I love working with him. Good. You don't have to worry about throwing your shoes at him. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. But you did, you know, sign your rights away to your son to Disney. So that's. Yes, nice that's story. true. The mouse. You know, Sean, I did. I did read somewhere that I am sorry that I didn't call you by your official title of Dr. Sean Patrick O'Reilly. Well, I appreciate that. I'm actually still, uh, I did, I've done all my coursework and I'm on chapter four out of seven for my dissertation. So I now need to, uh, I need to experiment. Uh, and to be honest, I've actually put it a little bit on hold with all the screenwriting. Maybe chat GPT will help me get through some more writing quickly. Uh, but I'm, I'm literally at the final thrall. So I need to get that experiment done and then finish off my last parts of the dissertation. But it's in information services and technology. Like how much more tech can you show them? Like your last three cartoons? Exactly. Well, and then that was part of it. And so what I'm hoping to do is, you know, I, I actually thought about this morning. It's funny you mentioned that. Um, it's one of the things that's, you know, I'm 99% I'm of the way there. Let's call it 95%. And I really still want to cross that finish line. I just got to kind of clear some path for my time. And I'm also producing like, Things have gone kind of crazy in the last three years. I'm producing a movie called The Order based on the New York Times bestseller. Um, other producers, uh, it's Jude Law, AGC. It's an Amazon original filming in Alberta. So that's been really fun and taking up a lot of my time these days. And with Arcana, were you guys the ones that released the, the sigh from the author that did Persepolis? No, I don't, I don't think that was. Sorry. Okay. Because I... There was, I thought it was you guys that did it, but I, but I'm, well, I'm wrong at this point. Yeah. No, right now, uh, production of Ultra Duck, and it's exactly what you think. It's a super powered duck uh, based on a character created by Edgar Delgado and published by us. So we're about halfway through animation. Assets are complete, and I hope to have it done by the end of 2023 for 2024 release. Well, that's fantastic. Man. I, you're keeping yourself busy. Uh, I love that your balance is between adult and childhood and you're making them work as, as a full grown uh, human being. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. And when I grow up, I hope to do more live action. I've, I, I'm trying to get my next one set up right now, but boy, it's been uh, between, you know, I'm part of the Writers Guild of Canada, uh, but now there's a SAG strike looming. DJ apparently have figured that out but I, I want i love writing directing producing uh when i can do that trifecta on live action that's where i really enjoy it so i'm trying to get my next one set up how does the writers guild of america in relation to writers guild of canada balance out the do you guys have a solidarity with with the strike here in the united states yeah obviously we're in full support um there's actually a, a meeting with uh wgc this thursday and you know we haven't our guild is actually happy, happily in contract. Um, and so we obviously are in hundred percent support. And I think we'll be given more direction this Thursday on, on how far do you support, right? So yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see the next couple of months. I think this might be a long one too, between the streamers not wanting to necessarily give up the proprietary information between AI, which is throwing a monkey wrench on the entire planet. Uh, there's lots of lots of unknowns right now. Well, on the bright side with all of that, you can get all the kids in the hall together again. Oh, exactly. Exactly. I love those guys. I already watched the, I did the new one that came out on Netflix. I watched that, like, I think I was done by Friday night. Like, I binged that thing so easily. You know, I, I feel bad for all of them because they've done so much in their careers outside of kids in the hall. They're all parents, and I think a couple of them are grandparents at this point. And they're like, when are you going to bring back kids in the hall? 
so you guys can relive 1982 through 87. Exactly. No, I, I, I think it's so funny. It's such a unique sense of humor. Watching the Netflix specials, the new season was like, it was perfectly on brand. It's exactly how I remembered it. And so that was really fun. You know, in, in being in Canada, you have a little more flexibility, especially right now, because you guys haven't decided to strike in solidarity with the WGA. Um, does it look like more production will go to Canada at this point? So you guys can create more content in the meantime? Possibly. So right now, so the ones people are keeping an eye on, um, so obviously writers, it's kind of pens down for everyone from development, everything. Uh, so screenplays that are already, well, even Deadpool 3, I read, and you never know what to believe when you read it, but uh, Ryan Reynolds apparently can't improvise. He's got to go exactly off the screenplay. Uh, I mean, the nice part is he's in a mask for, you know, over half the movie, so they can always do ADR later. But, um, yeah, I mean, rules like those, you got to kind of figure out how to theoretically keep up with production uh, while doing whatever you can to support WGA and all the writers. And I do have to ask this for my own personal curiosity. What does Heroes of the Golden Mask sequel look like? Oh, well, it's funny. So I actually have it pitched. I, I wrote it out. You never know how these things are going to go. I hope it leads to great success and everyone's happy and, and it does well. Uh, it will actually be exploring other lost cities. Um, so there's other heroes, um, like Kai mentioned, Atlantis, um, San Shudui, Machu Picchu, Chichen Itza. It'll be going to other characters, lost cities, and maybe even set in Atlantis. And for a third installment, will you guys go to Pompeii and try to save the people before the earthquake or the volcano erupting? I, we are now, as long as you don't stay, as long as we can. That'd be a great one, though. So long as you throw me a bone and put me in as like a backup voice, voice character, we're golden. Handshake, digital handshake. There you go. <laughs> Listen, man, congratulations on Heroes of the Golden Mask. Congratulations on all your success. Um, when the DVD is finally, because I know it's coming out this Friday, cor correct? Correct, um, that's right, June 9th. So the American release is June 9th. We're going to have the English dubbing for it. Uh, will there be bonus content where, like some of the other international films, we can hear it in Mandarin or, or Cantonese, or I've seen the Russian poster, you know, hear the other voice actors when it comes out on Blu-ray? Yeah, I assume so and hope so. I mean, I know it's also going to have a wide theatrical release in China. Uh, the U.S. had first window. And so um, shortly thereafter, I'll have a Chinese um, theatrical release. And uh, yeah, it's already licensed to quite a few countries. So things seem to be picking up. Uh, and it's kind of weird because you never know. Every territory is allowed to market the movie how they want. So sometimes you kind of see a poster he didn't know existed or he's like corrective measures. I love it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, the Australian poster has a lot of the monsters and creatures from corrective measures. And um, it looks great. I loved it. So it's always funny to see the marketing materials because sometimes it catches you off guard, but it's always cool to see what people see in the movie and how they want to angle it. Awesome. Listen, Sean, remind us why we need to see Heroes of the Golden Dragon this Friday. And where can we find you and Arcana on social media if we want to connect with you? Yeah, so it's all Arcana Studio on Twitter. Um, Facebook, same thing, Arcana Studio. Same with Instagram. And yeah, June 9th, Heroes of the Golden Mask, uh, starring Patton Oswalt, Ron Perlman, Christopher Plummer. Uh, I'm super excited for it. Hopefully you will be as well. And hope to talk to you soon.